Well, thanks everyone for joining today. My name is Damon Tordini. I'm a simulation application specialist for Hawkridge Systems. And so uh, I'm here today to present to you guys uh, what we call Motion 101. Essentially, this is intended to be your, your intro to Motion and be your first uh, description of the capabilities of the tool, what it actually does for you, and more specifically, you know, how you would use it um, in relation to SOLIDWORKS in general and our other simulation tools. So let's take a deeper look into Motion here. What is motion simulation? Uh, essentially, in SOLIDWORKS, our motion simulation tool is something that will help you study the motion of systems or mechanisms. So in the terms of what SOLIDWORKS mechanisms would be, we're, we're basically talking about assemblies there. right? So a model that consists of more than one part that has some kind of relative motion between them. And so when we are going to be setting up and running these motion simulations, the motion of your system is going to be determined by the mates of the parts, the way that you've built up your assembly and connected the different parts together, the mass and inertia properties of the components, so their actual, uh, you know, for example, weights that are based on the material properties of those components as well as their geometry, um, any forces or other loads that you have applied to the system, everything from forces and torques to springs, or gravity, and also motors and actuators. Uh, so these are going to be things that actually drive or cause input to the motion of the system, whether that's through a displacement function or some kind of known velocity or something like that. And of course, time is the, the controlling factor in all of those things. And so that's really the key difference between motion simulation and, for example, your typical stress analysis, is that you will be able to see these results over time rather than in a single static scenario. So if you have any familiarity with our simulation offerings, the way that motion simulation fits into that is that if you have a license of SOLIDWORKS Premium, which is the highest version of SOLIDWORKS, you actually have our motions capability already built in. Um, so it is called SOLIDWORKS Motion as far as the add-in. And so that means you'll be able to do most of what is available in motion, along with being able to run your static analyses for stresses or displacements. In addition to that, there's something else called event-based motion, which I'll get to a little bit later, which is in a higher package. But keep in mind that basically everything I'm going to talk about right now uh, in the next few moments here is in SOLIDWORKS Premium. So many of you likely have access to it already. So first of all, where do you even get to SOLIDWORKS Motion if you have SOLIDWORKS Premium and you want to start trying this out? The first thing you would need to do is go to your add-ins menu. So uh, tools, add-ons, SOLIDWORKS Motion. You'll see the icon in there. And of course, just like any other add-on, you can check the box on the left to uh, make sure that it starts up immediately. And then on the right-hand side, you can make it automatically start every time you launch SOLIDWORKS. Once the add-ins enabled, you'll be able to get to your motion studies in the same area where you would go to create animations. So down at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll have a series of tabs next to the tab that says model under the feature manager design tree. And uh, so it's actually the same interface that you would use to create your animations. When we turn on the motion add-in though, that's going to allow us to use some additional capabilities and also get a lot of results that we wouldn't be able to get out of a simple animation. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at what motion actually does compared and contrasted to SOLIDWORKS simulation, which for this example here, we're going to focus purely on the static or stress analysis, which hopefully some of you have familiarity with. So whereas your stress analysis will only simulate what we call a static equilibrium problem, where you've got, for example, some loads and some fixtures put on a model, and everything is essentially staying put where it is, and of course, stresses and displacements are developing in the model. By contrast, motion can simulate moving systems, dynamic systems, where you'll be able to see results changing over time, and, for example, be able to see uh, how quickly something speeds up or slows down. Another key difference is that in your SOLIDWORKS simulation stress analysis, 
the solid bodies that you have, whether they're parts that you've modeled or imported or any other type of geometry, they're all going to be deformable. And of course, the purpose of running a stress analysis is to see how much something deforms for given loads and how high the stresses get. That is not the case in SOLIDWORKS motion. The purpose of the motion analysis is to mainly check things like your reaction forces or speeds or accelerations. And so the solid bodies, for example, the parts in this case, are treated as rigid bodies. So they are not going to be able to deform or show you uh, stresses throughout the entire assembly. Another big difference is that in your stress analysis in SOLIDWORKS simulation, assembly mates don't have any bearing on the conditions of the simulation. All the interactions between different parts are set up separately once you create a new study. In motion, however, all of your assembly mates are recognized. And so it's key to make sure that when you're building your assembly, that, for example, hinges or slider mechanisms all work properly the way you would want them to with the mates that you've created. And then finally, the type of results that you'll get out of your stress analysis will include things like displacements, reaction forces, but then also stresses and strains, as well as factor of safeties. Whereas motion, because it doesn't treat those parts as deformable and doesn't check the stresses, instead it's going to give you displacements for the entire part, for, for example, how much uh, an entire part is rotating or moving as a whole, reaction forces on those parts at things like the mate locations, and then accelerations, but then also things like motor power and motor torque. So it's used for sizing these mechanisms rather than for checking whether a part will fail structurally. Some of the basic laws that are used to run the calculations in the motion tool are really just your basic laws of motion. Like, for example, Newton's first law, bodies of motion tend to stay in motion or bodies at rest tend to stay at rest. And conservation of momentum, which is where we get our F equals MA equation from. So, Really, it is very simple, uh, for the most part, kinematic physics that are being applied here to solve what is happening to these components under the different loads. Now, there are two main types of mechanisms that motion will handle. There's what we would call a kinematic system, where all of the motion of the parts is basically constrained by, for example, your mates or other um, restraints on the parts. And essentially, the parts will have zero degrees of freedom in the end, zero net degrees of freedom. In other words, they're all tamed in the sense that the mates are the only allowable type of motion on those parts. By contrast, we also have the ability to set up a dynamic system where you'll have components that are able to move around freely, not under the constraint of a mate, but instead will, for example, uh, be able to handle things like complex contact between the parts, moving around on a free path where that motion is controlled by other loads like gravity or forces, and also uh, contact with other components in 3D space. Now the types of loads that we're going to be able to put onto a motion study are similar in concept to what you may have seen in a stress analysis before. So, for example, we'll be able to put on forces and gravity um, and springs and a couple other types of loads. So again, this is generally what, one of the things that will cause motion or will affect the motion in the assembly. And of course, they're usually used to simulate some sort of real-world component. Uh, for example, a spring would likely be used to simulate a spring or something else that causes uh, a similar reaction, like for example, a, a budgie cord of some sort or something that applies tension uh, or resists any other kind of motion. Now, loads that we put onto our structure are going to be transferred through the mates if we have any different kinds of hinge mates or, or other mechanisms in the assembly, and we'll be able to check what those loads are later on. For example, finding the reaction forces or uh, finding the, the torques through, through a hinge. Uh, we can also specify forces and torques as an input to simulate some other component applying loads to the system. And also, when you want to apply springs and dampers, you can apply them as a linear form where it's a simple uh, spring constant, for example. Or it can be more complex where you have, uh, for example, uh, multiple term 
you know, nonlinear spring and use those types of things to check the response for an impact in the shock load. Now, again, just to clarify, we're not talking about stresses there or the deformation of the body, but it would be possible to check, for example, uh, how long something will oscillate back and forth until it gets stamped out. Now also, let's just get a little bit more detail here about what degrees of freedom mean, because when we talk about degrees of freedom in motion, we're mainly talking about where the components are allowed to move, and it does become rather important, especially when you get into more advanced analyses with analog gates in them. And so the concept of degrees of freedom just relates to where something is allowed to move and where it's not allowed to move. If you're talking about a Cartesian space, 3D space, a uh, rigid object is generally described to have six degrees of freedom. So those six degrees of freedom would be three in the translational directions, so moving just in a straight line in X, Y, and Z, and then also being able to rotate about those three axes. So, for example, if you're talking about an airplane, that would be like pitch and yaw and roll, so rotation about those same axes. And so in motion simulation, uh, the conditions of the problem, like, for example, the geometry and how many mates you have determine how many total degrees of freedom there are. And uh, so again, an unrestrained part that's just sitting out there would have six degrees of freedom, a single part would. Um, a hinge mate where it's, for example, only allowed to rotate about the axis of the hinge and, and can't move in any other direction, that would have one degree of freedom. And then if a part was completely restrained and couldn't move at all, that would mean it has zero degrees of freedom. And so, of course, more degrees of freedom means it's more complex and it's going to take a little bit more effort for the computer to solve that. Now, the last part here that's most important are the motors. And so, motors are the most common way that we actually drive the motion or input the motion into an assembly. Usually, they're meant to simulate a real world motor, whether that means a you know, mechanical motor, like an electrical motor, or something that might be human powered. But basically, anything that would cause something to move, or turn, or slide. And so, the types of motors we can put in are rotary motors, that would be circular in nature, uh, linear motor or linear actuator, which would basically move something in a straight line, or a pathmate motor, where we can sketch out or model out some sort of a route that cause an object to move along that path. One of the most powerful parts about the motors is that you can define them a lot of different ways. So, for example, we could put in uh, a simple constant velocity motor, like something turning at a known RPM. Or we could say that we want it to move a certain distance in a set period of time. But then we can also use much more complicated functions, like, for example, step functions where we directly type in a table of different uh, displacements versus time, for example or even other more complex mathematical functions like sine and cosine, arc cosine, log functions, etc. So there again, there is a large assortment of possibilities for describing uh, how the input motion will work. The key use for motors when you're using motion simulation is that afterwards you can plot things like the power consumption of the motor and the motor torque that would cause the motion that you've typed in figure out how big of a motor you actually need in order to achieve that motion. So let's look really quick at a simple scenario that takes into account most of that setup. What we've got here is a simple crank assembly where we're pushing sort of a square-shaped piston back and forth. This is obviously not the same as a normal engine piston, but it's a similar concept. And so if, for example, we were trying to figure out um, how quickly, for example, the piston would move back and forth in that oscillating fashion for a given RPM, and also things like what the torque required to actually turn that crank would be, uh, we can use motion simulation to figure that thing out. So, again, we have to make sure that our motion simulation add-on is turned on. So, again, that would consist of going to the add-ins menu here and checking the box. Also, you can go to the Office Products tab in the Command Manager and enable it there. Once that's done, we would go down to the tabs at the bottom of the screen and switch to the relevant motion study. If you didn't have 
uh, any motion study, you still would actually have a tab there that says motion study one. You may have noticed that you uh, always have that tab every time you create a new file in SolidWorks. And so by default, it's blank, but when you click over to it, you'll be able to start defining all of the conditions. So let me make a new motion study real quickly here. Let's go ahead and just right click and say create new motion study. And so when you do so, you'll see that it's actually the same exact interface for when you want to create an animation. So anybody that's ever tried to make an animation in an assembly has already got some familiarity with motion. Essentially the difference is that you would go to your drop down menu here and switch from the basic animation to motion analysis. That adds some extra capabilities for what you can define as far as conditions for the motion. And then it also will allow you to see actual result plots, which the animation cannot do. So let's say, for example, that we want to put a motor on to simply spin that crank and turn uh, the shafts of the piston moves back and forth. So what we can do is go right here to the upper bar in the motion manager, and we have a button to apply a motor. And when the motor property manager comes up, you can see those different types of motors we have available. So for example, if we want a rotary motor, we can put it on this cylindrical face of the crank arm. And we can do things like set what direction we want it to go in, and then describe the motion in different ways, whether it's a known constant speed or a known distance over time, or those other more complex functions that we talked about earlier. So let's just say we want this to spin at a constant speed and put in some RPM, let's say 45 RPM, right? very slow crank. When we click OK, the motor will be created and it will have a default duration of five seconds. So we then have to decide not only how long do we want the whole motion study itself to run in physical time, but also how long do we want the motor to run. So if I wanted this to go longer, let's say 10 seconds, I could actually click and drag this black diamond here, which we call a key, and that changes the length of the simulation. The brownish bars that you see underneath that are showing the duration of time that the motor is active. And in this case, I'm going to let it run the entire 10 seconds, but it would also be possible to turn off or turn on that motor or other motors or other conditions over time so that you can realistically simulate mechanisms that, again, don't have constant conditions. Things might be changing all the time, and you can simulate that. So if we want to get our results here, what we can do is go right to this Calculate button. And that will go through and do all the necessary motion calculations to figure out how this thing will actually move over 10 seconds. So of course, we can then go back and play the animation from the start. And this will, by default, play at real-time speed. So this is what it would look like in the real world if we were actually uh, seeing the, the real mechanism. And I can, of course, you know, reciprocate the animation and so forth. And so right away, this gives you a nice idea of you know, just generally how something will look when it moves, how quickly is it going to move. And then we can start digging into some more detailed results as far as plots or other types of data. So, for example, let's say we're concerned with knowing exactly what the motion profile of that piston looks like as it moves back and forth. We can create a result plot with this button right here to check that. So under result, we can select, for example, displacements if we're concerned about the position. And then from that subcategory, we can do things like check the linear displacement in any particular direction or check uh, velocities or accelerations as well. We can trace the path of motion out in 3D or we can do things like check the position of the center of mass. So I'm going to check the X position of the center of mass which is the direction the piston's moving in and I'll click one of the faces on this component so that I can check it um, for that part only and you can see the center of mass symbol shows up. So when I click OK, this is going to create a new plot here. And what's nice is I can not only view the results over time, but when I animate this motion study, I can see a red bar that shows exactly where on the result plot I'm at as this animates. So as you would expect, the center of mass is basically moving back and forth anywhere from 
negative 30 to negative 100 millimeters. By the way, that's relative to the organ. So maybe if we want to get into a little more detail now about whether this mechanism is balanced properly, we can start to include some of the other loads that might affect the balance. So one of the big ones might be gravity, right? Depending on how this is oriented um, and depending on the design of the actual crank arm component, the gravity will of course affect whether it rotates uh, with constant torque requirements or maybe the torque is changing all over. So if we want to apply gravity, we can simply click the button for gravity right here. It looks like an apple. And we can specify the direction of gravity and the magnitude. Normally, you wouldn't change the magnitude as long as you're still on Earth at sea level uh, or you know, relatively close to the ground. And so now that we have a gravitational force, we'll likely see a little bit of a difference in things like the motor torque. The motion is still going to be the same when we animate this. And that's because the motor is controlling the motion. So we're assuming that we're going to have a motor that will do the job that we've described, but then the result plots will tell us the requirements of that motor. So for example, back in the first study that we ran here, if we want to check a plot showing the motor torque, we can go to this forces drop down and say that we're interested in the motor torque and check, for example, the overall magnitude of that torque and then select the motor that we created. So for example, here we've got the torque in uh, Newton millimeters as this animates. And we'll see that it isn't constant because as you would expect, uh, this component is not perfectly balanced. There's a little bit of more weight on one side of the crank arm. So um, it's going to oscillate a little bit and it'll have to put out more torque and it's in a certain position where it has to lift up the heavier side. But if we want to see that more accurately, we'll now look at it with gravity enabled, and that'll be, uh, of course, more realistic, where we've got the downward component of force um, acting on this in the y direction. So now that gravity is enabled, we can look at the same plot. And you can see that now it looks quite different, and that's because in this case, as this animation plays, there are a couple points where the motor torque almost zeroes out. And it seems to be roughly when it's essentially balanced so that the heavy side is, is horizontal with the lighter side. So the more torque is required to lift it up over and then to pull it back through on the bottom to continue spinning this piston. Let's add one more condition. Let's look at what would happen if we had a spring in here as well, which will again add another layer of complexity to how much torque you would need to push this mechanism along. So far, all we've been worrying about is counteracting gravity. But if we, for example, clicked here to create a spring between the piston and its chamber, that of course would increase the amount of force you need as the piston gets closer to that wall and would probably decrease the amount of motor torque you would need as it gets further away, as you'll have a tensile force pulling it back to its original position. And so for the spring, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, we can specify a lot of different types of springs, whether it's a simple linear spring or something more complex. We can put in the actual spring constant and what the initial free length of the spring is. This would allow you to put in a preload on the spring. If you put in that the free length was, for example, longer than the current distance between the two faces where the spring is connected. We also have some options to change how the spring actually looks. And this way, when we animate, we'll be able to see, for example, in our motor torque plot, that now we still have those zeroing out points where basically the motor torque is almost zero because of the, the balanced position of the crank arm. But now we also have more of an oscillation depending on where the piston is, affecting how much torque you need to keep it moving. You can also see that overall the torques are much higher because we're counteracting a significant force now to move the piston. Whereas before, we were assuming everything was basically frictionless because of the mates that were in place. Now another layer of complexity that could be added to a simulation like that is to include contact. As I mentioned, in that situation, we had the assembly already mated so that 
we got the desired hinge effects or sliding mechanisms for the piston. So that means that we weren't accounting for any kind of frictional effects or actual contact between the bodies. However, if you want to simulate that in using the capability of a, of a dynamic system rather than just a kinematic, we can use solid body contact input to SOLIDWORKS motion where we'll be able to select different bodies in the assembly and essentially tell motion that those bodies cannot penetrate each other. And what that will do is actually function similar to the collision detection tool in a normal SOLIDWORKS assembly where it will check for the boundaries of the model and it will of course move the components uh, such that they can't penetrate each other and that they might even push along each other uh, if you've got other loads on the system. So again, it checks the model part geometry, however you created it, or any kind of penetrations or collisions. It will model the transfer of momentum or energy between the parts. So for example, you'd be able to do a bowling ball example, uh, knocking over some pins, because the energy from the bowling ball would be transferred to those pins. It also has the ability to account for relative stiffness of the different materials. Now it won't deform the parts as I mentioned earlier because this doesn't check for strains or stresses, but it will use that information to accurately show, again, how much energy would be transferred to the different parts, which will drive how quickly they might move, or for example, in the bowling case, how far the pins would fly. Uh, also, these contacts are going to be defined at the part level. It's not going to be necessary to select the individual faces for contact like you do in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So it's a little bit simpler to set up. Also, the accuracy of the contact is one of the key things that you can control in SOLIDWORKS motion. Basically, you have this option uh, to lower or uh, increase the 3D contact resolution, which essentially controls how closely the geometry that you've modeled gets mapped. It's very similar in concept to the meshing that we have in SOLIDWORKS simulation. You also have the option to check a box called Use Precise Contact, and that will use the original SOLIDWORKS geometry. It won't try to approximate it with this mesh at all. So that would, of course, be the most accurate, but will also take significantly longer to solve uh, for the same motion problem. So let's look at an example that has contact now. And one nice one that we have here is this pipe lifter example. So if you haven't seen one of these before, these are typically used in all kinds of construction scenarios where you have a big concrete donut of pipe and you need to lift it up. And the way they typically work is you have these arms essentially that are hinged on the three sides so that when the mechanisms lowered inside the concrete donut. You then have some friction force between the arms and the wall of the donut, and these little uh, teethed ends basically cause some friction, and when you try to lift up on the mechanism, the pipe is pulled up as well. So again, because in that case, uh, the motion is not going to be something that we can define with a mate, since it's not going to move at first and then the pipe will move along with the mechanism later, we need to use the contact in this case. So the setup here is that we've first of all got a gravitational load and of course the gravity load is going to give some sort of a resistance when you try to lift up the pipe here. We also have a motor controlling the motion of this lifter base component. In this case, it's a linear motor, and we've got the motion defined as oscillating. So that means that it's going to move downward to half a meter here, and the period of that motion will be 0.1 hertz frequency. And so essentially this is going to solve for one cycle, where it's going to move downwards the half meter and then back up to its original position. And this plot here will show you right away what the displacement versus time of that motor will look like. Again, it would be possible to put in a much more complex motor profile if you wanted to. Finally, to get the contact to work, we have these contact sets that are specified here, where again, we can select the different components in the assembly, and then we can also choose to include friction, which in this case is necessary to make sure that the pipe actually gets lifted. And we do that by selecting different materials, for example, one side being uh, steel, 
let's say dry, and the other side we could say is aluminum or acrylic or any other material that we want, and that will put in the correct friction coefficients for those two materials. It's also possible to just override that and put in our own properties if we don't want to use a predefined material. So here what we've got are some contacts between the arms and the lifter so that the arms uh, stop here at their minimum position of being horizontal. We have contact between the pipe and the ground so it doesn't fall through. And then we have the contact between the arms and the pipe which is the most important. So let's go ahead and animate this and we can actually collapse the motion manager here to get a better idea of what it looks like. So the motor is lowering the lifter mechanism. As it pulls up, we get that contact that happens between the two parts. The hinge mate flexes a little bit and then it continues to pull up the concrete donut. It's also possible to look at some result plots while this is happening. So for example, we can look here at the applied force and the reactions as well. One of the other capabilities of SOLIDWORKS Motion is that we can actually export the results from Motion to a SOLIDWORKS simulation study so that we can, for example, use the reaction forces calculated at a mate location as the forces uh, in our static study so that way we can get a more accurate representation of the stresses. In addition to that we could even actually run a combined stress analysis where on a single component we'll be able to take the reaction forces that motion is calculating and run a static study on that component for each time frame of the motion simulation and it'll actually be able to animate that for you. That's a little bit more of an advanced concept, so we'll cover that in more detail in a future motion e-learning. The last little bit of information uh, as far as options that I want to give you here are that there are different solvers that it's possible to use in motion. The default one is called GSTIF, and most of the time you won't need to change that. It is pretty fast and accurate by default, and it's used for pretty much any type of motion simulation. However, there are some other options that are good in certain special cases. For example, if you need improved accuracy, and particularly if you have a scenario where you've got a lot of rapidly changing conditions, the WSTIF solver can be used, which does function at a performance penalty, but again, improved accuracy. We also have something called the SI2 solver, which has better accuracy for velocities and accelerations. If those types of motion profiles are the key result you're looking for, but it can be slower. And if you go into your uh, SOLIDWORKS motion options here, which again is in the motion manager, we have our motion analysis settings here. So this is where we can do things like choose the frame rate. And then under advanced options, we have the options for the different solvers. The last thing I want to talk about is another capability we have called event-based motion. So far what we've been talking about is our normal motion analysis where all the conditions are defined in terms of time. And, and what that means is we have to specify exactly when they happen and for how long they happen. However, a lot of times when you're trying to set up the motion of some sort of mechanism, you don't necessarily have that information. You may not know exactly when a motor needs to kick in because it's going to be dependent on the last motor. So event-based motion instead can run a motion simulation where we define all the conditions in the order of a task that needs to be accomplished and then we can choose different triggers for what causes that task to start whether it's the completion of a previous task or the activation of some sort of a sensor or any other type of motion position. We also have the ability to use servo motors to control actions so that motors will kick in under certain conditions. For example, like I mentioned, 
we can do a conveyor system where a box moves down a conveyor belt and once it hits a sensor at a certain position that might activate another mechanism to lift the box or to move it to another conveyor belt. And so we can use proximity sensors, again, which check the displacements or positions of these different components to trigger these actions. We can also create what are called Gantt charts to see basically what the logical flow of these different tasks is in the motion study. We also have the ability to export that to Excel to not only show things like the positions of the components and other results, but the workflow of all the different events. Now before we see an example of this, I just want to make sure to point out that event-based motion is an extra capability above the normal SOLIDWORKS motion. And so if you have SOLIDWORKS Premium, you won't have access to the event-based motion. It's something that you will need to purchase simulation professional to access. And again, some of you may already have that, and so if so, uh, you're free to go play around with it immediately. So let's look at a quick example of event-based motion. In this case, what we're going to look at is a more complex mechanism where, again, we have a lot of different motors that are all firing and they are going to be triggered by these different events here. So let's look at, uh, for example, the pick and place grabber master. And so this is a mechanism that's meant to essentially uh, grab some small parts that are part of an assembly line and put them into a rotating mechanism that might, for example, fill them if it was a container of some kind. So again, if we were to set this up in the classical method of motion, some of the limitations here would be that we'd have to define all of the motors and conditions in terms of exactly when everything happens. So you can see here, for example, we've got some motors uh, controlling the motion of different axes, and we have a large set of data points describing exactly what the motion profile of that motor is and when exactly it fires. But again, if you're trying to do things like optimize cycle time, that's not necessarily practical or easy to come up with. So the alternative is instead to define this as event-based motion. Event-based motion has a different layout, as you can see here, where primarily what the difference is, is that while you'll still have uh, the same general inputs of motors and gravity or forces and those other things, uh, we're instead able to trigger that the motor occurs when, for example, the last motor finishes. If you want to break them up into smaller parts, or you can still do them at specific times, or again, you can trigger them when a sensor is activated. For example, when the part is right over the slot where the grabber needs to drop it, you can set up a sensor so that instead of having to time exactly when that uh, grabber would release the part, it will detect automatically when it's in the correct position to do so. So let's look at the example here of the event-based motion set up this way. And again, we can animate this just like a regular motion study and see what it looks like over time. So if you look at the motion manager down there, the green bar is showing which motor or other input is being activated at this time, and the Gantt chart on the right is showing essentially the logical flow from one event to the other. So again, this can be used to optimize cycle time by putting in things like uh, a known uh, velocity that the uh, motor could put out, but not knowing exactly how long it's going to take to move all around to the different positions in the model. So again, if doing more complex mechanisms and optimizing cycle time is something that you need to study in more detail, event-based motion will probably be the tool that you need. So that about wraps up our discussion of motion at this point. Um, just want to say thanks again for attending and hope to see you next time.